For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe Hendricks. For those of you who do know me, I'm only moderating, so I won't be talking that long. So you won't have to hear me that much. That's great. Uh, I have been married about six years. We have three kids, baby number four on the way. I'm a member at St. Anthony's Parish here in town. I work up at the Newman Center on the campus of NDSU. So there aren't any UND fans in here, right? Okay, uh, we'll, I'll cross that joke off and we'll move on. <laughs> no, welcome everybody from, from Grand Forks and from farther away. We're thrilled that you're able to join us, that you can make the trek here today. So we're going into a, a panel here. We have three people to speak on the subject is Into the Wilderness, Prayer as the Source of Greatness, and this one in particular, Spousal and Family Prayer. Into the Wilderness. This ties in so well with identity, what we were hearing from, from Bill and Father Sean this morning. And uh, think of when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the attacks from Satan, you know, if you are the Son of God, then do this, you know, prove it, trying to attack, attack this identity as the Son of God. And obviously that prayer is such a key way into hearing God speaking to us and saying, yes, you are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. One of my favorite saints, Augustine, or some of you can correct me later and say Augustine, one of the legends is that he was in prayer and he heard the Lord say to him, you know, ask me, ask me any question. And he said, okay, I have two. Just two, just two. Who are you and who am I? This is from one of the greatest philosophical minds. All of us kind of wrestle with that, our, our identity, right? Who is God and who are we in relation to him? So with that being said, we're going to have all of life's questions answered right here in just a minute by these three speakers. <laughs> All right, so just on my left here, we have Mike Splonskowski. If you're from around the area um, and you haven't heard of the Splonskowskis, you are a liar. <laughs> He's been married for 48 years to his wife, Karen. Together, they've raised 13 children and 54 grandchildren. And I hadn't actually met Mike before uh, five minutes ago here, but have met several of his children. So I can just attest those kids like that don't come from mediocre parents. So thank you for living out your vocation so well. And right next to him, of course, Bill Donahue, I don't think we have to say too much, did a fantastic job this morning uh, as our keynote here. Um, Bill, I had the, the pleasure of meeting him, hearing him speak here a couple years ago for, a, I guess, a continuing education for NFP instructors. And I was thrilled that Bill got him back here, that, excuse me, that Brad got Bill back here a second time. Thank you so much, Bill, for being with us. And then Nathan Sather, Nathan and his wife, and. Angela have been married for 18 years and they have nine children. So his career has taken him so many different places. He's in the military, continues to be in the military today, serving as the Air National Guard here in Fargo. He's done contract work for the CIA. And he and his wife gave their life to Jesus and his church after learning about JP2's Theology of the Body back in 2006. So with that being said, uh, how about we just give him a quick round of applause and then we'll call him up. There we, there we go. Oh. All right, I'd like to begin, first of all, by just being honored to be with you all as men. I love these conferences. Your presence with me is always inspiring. Uh, so thank you for your, your presence, first and foremost. For me, if someone asks me about spousal prayer, my first question is, what's the most central part of prayer? And whether you're Christian or not, usually that centers around an altar. Even the pagans knew enough to build altars to come into some kind of contact with something greater than themselves. And I remember St. Monica talking about her son also, asked him after she died to remember him on the anniversary of her death at the altar. She didn't say, remember me at Mass, or remember me when you pray. It was, remember me at the altar. And so the altar really is the central component of our faith. Now, it's not the Eucharist. I understand that. It's not Jesus. I understand that. But to a large degree, we give greater deference to the altar than we do to Christ himself. If we come into the sanctuary, we genuflect to the tabernacle unless one thing is happening, Mass. At Mass, we actually bow to the altar and almost regulate the tabernacle as not being the central point of our focus anymore. So in the home, is there a place 
that is our central place to go for prayer, our altar, if you will, in our domestic church. What I'm going to propose to you is that place is our beds, especially our marriage beds. With the altar that we have at church, we receive communion literally with Jesus. We come into contact with God's body uh, in our own body by his body coming to us at the altar. I have seen through military ministry working both as a, as a person and as a chaplain assistant some of the craziest altars you've ever seen in your life. I had the privilege one Easter Sunday of celebrating Mass literally on the hood of my Humvee headquarters 32. The chaplain used my Humvee as the hood. We had to have an altar to celebrate Mass. Now, if it's true that Jesus says we must have life in him only if we receive the Eucharist, then it would also be true that with no altar, there is no Eucharist. There is no life without that altar. I'd propose to you that essentially what that means is that if our beds are these sacred places that take the place of our altar where we come into contact with God's own body, that there are two basic reasons for this. And that is our sacred places because that's where we love our spouses and that is where we pray together. And I practically want to give you two examples. Pray with your spouse intentionally, either before, during, or after you engage in marital relations with your spouse. Yes, maybe even during. It might sound awkward and it might sound foolish for some of us, especially if you haven't been doing it. But I can guarantee you, there's not a man in this room who has enough love in his heart to satisfy the needs for love that come from his spouse, who is also his sister, his bride. Only God has the kind of love that can truly satisfy the heart of any woman, or for that matter, us as beloved sons. If you can't do it, you need someone to help you. That someone is your divine spouse also, namely God himself. And I can promise you, once you get past the awkwardness of doing it for the first couple times, it transforms your marriage, your life, and it transforms your children. I can also say, Catholics are supposed to have the greatest, most meaningful and satisfying sex lives of any particular group of people on earth. Why? Because we come into contact and communion with Christ himself, who is love embodied, just like we are embodied souls. Number two, more practically, my brother who passed away a couple years ago gave me advice that was absolutely horrible when I got married. He said, never go to bed angry. And I tried for years, years to meet that requirement. Oh, we gotta work it out, we gotta work it out. I have since learned that my brother, while he loves me, is an idiot. <laughs> there are many times it should be expected that you go to bed angry. Why? Because when you navigate life with a person that is entirely different than you, there are just simply times where you cannot reconcile based on your own capacities to know and understand each other. Only God can do that. And there are moments, practically, this is how it happens. I'll say the same things over and over again. My wife will hear those same things over and over again, the third, the fourth time. And what does she do? She says the same thing three and four times again. We're confused. We aren't understanding each other. That's not our domain to understand. I recognize in that moment I'm under a demonic attack. God is not the author of confusion. What do we need to do? We literally need to go to bed. Be done with this confusion. Don't let it sow more seeds. We go to bed, my wife and I, we don't pray together, but we pray together. I lay in that bed and I face away from her, she faces away from me, and I silently to myself and my wife does the same, Praise for God to grant us the gifts of wisdom and understanding because we can't solve this together. We need him to get involved. And amazingly, while we sleep, God works on our heart. We're kind of trying to get the point across today, which I heard from Bill's talk. It's not about my actions. It's about my openness. The last thing I do before I bed is to pray for that openness. It has the ability to transform my heart even while I sleep. That's how powerful God is. He does not need my actions. He can do it in my sleep. And oftentimes I have woken up, and my wife and I look at each other, and I'm like, what happened last night? I don't know. 
And amazingly, it's exceptionally much more easier with those graces from God after asking for them and letting it go, letting him into our life, that suddenly what was irreconcilable, even just a few hours before, becomes a whole lot easier to do in the future. And the reason for that is because marriage itself is an institution. When I can't understand my wife, I don't have to expect her to provide something that she can't do. I lean on the institution of marriage itself. That will always be there. I know people come from different circumstances. Divorce is not an option for me. That means the institution of marriage has to get me through it because I can't do it without it. And when you can't reconcile to your spouse, just lean into that sacrament and the graces that come from it. And it can really absolutely transform your life. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. All right, good afternoon, gentlemen. Bill Donahue again. I am married 16 years to my wife, Rebecca, whom I met over the dumpster in the trash yard, if you recall. Uh, and we have four children, uh, one in heaven, actually, and four on earth, ages 10, 8, 6, and 3. So I'm going to uh, go back a little further and just kind of in my own experience and expression, talk about what prayer is, the importance of personal prayer, and then connect it to family prayer. To, we want to give a different spin, I think, um, from our own personal lived experiences. So for me, prayer, coming to understand what prayer is, of course, is a lifelong journey. I'm certainly no expert in prayer, but I'm um, trying to do it. It happens by doing. That's how we learn it. But I came across a great quote, a simple, simple quote from Monsignor Lorenzo Albacetti about what prayer is. So this is first for us personally, then we'll talk about spousally. He said, prayer is putting our, exposing ourselves to his face and waiting. Prayer is exposing ourselves, our face to his face, and then waiting. So that's an essential thing for me every single day. Every single day, personally, I get up early, and you know, some of us are uh, morning doves, some of us are night owls. Uh, my wife's a night owl, I was a morning dove, now we've met in the middle, right? We're both, both. <laughs> Kids help that too. But I still make the morning time my prayer time. So I get up at the crack of dawn, 5, 5.30, I get downstairs, and I've got my personal prayer. Okay, when you're married, and you guys know this, we're, we're preaching to the choir, to many of you here, you know this, but you're not just this uh, amorphous blob. When the two become one, you're still unique and distinct. You've got to pray personally to the Father, and your spouse has to pray personally to the Father, and then you come together and pray together. So my morning time is my time between me and our Lord. So I, I get down there, I get a good cup of coffee, I've got the gospel of the day, and I try to sit before the face. Right? I kind of sit, and Pope Benedict has this great line that prayer, prayer is a longing for God. So as I said in the earlier talk, a, a minute of quiet, maybe a little bit more, you start getting cultured by it, right? You just kind of sit there, let the Father love you, receive his word, drink it in, be present, look for what stirs your heart from God's word, uh, maybe it's, you know, maybe you're outside, you're watching the sun come up, whatever you might be doing, allow the Lord to speak to you in that ache, right? The, your face before his face. For me, personally, this personal prayer sets the tone of my day. It's, it's an essential. It's, it's, not, it's not interchangeable. I've got to have it. Now, um, before I segue into spousal prayer, I'll say as a, as a husband and father, I'm not so young, but I'm a young father. Uh, inevitably, the kids come tramping down the steps in the middle of this personal prayer. And this is something I've learned too. So prayer, family prayer now, I, it's, I'm not monastic. Okay, it would be great to be able to make a Eucharistic holy hour every day or have a half hour of scripture, but it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> and one time I had an experience of my son, he was probably four at the time, my eldest. I got downstairs for my prayer. I had the coffee, I had the candle lit, got the gospel open. I'm like, Lord, I'm here, I'm gonna pray. And then 5.15 a.m., little PJ'd feet coming down the steps. And my boy just crawls right up into my arms and snuggles into my lap. And I gotta put down the hot coffee, right? Blow out the candle, safety precaution. And like, okay. And I remember feeling like that moment, and again, as you know, young dad, or we only had the, the two kids at that point. Like, oh shoot, Lord, I'm sorry, I can't pray right now. <laughs> but I sat there for a moment and Seth just kind of snuggled in, started purring a little bit, as those little, little toddlers do. And it dawned on me, like, this is a new level of prayer. 
okay, I'm not doing prayer. I'm not reading the gospel right now and reflecting and doing the meditation, but the Father is holding the Son, and the Son is being held by the Father. That's the height of prayer. So when we talk about spousal prayer, family prayer, it's a different kind of prayer. Okay, we're not monks. As married men, we're not monks. Uh, we're not cloistered. It's different. And I think the Lord gives us, like that little story there, it gives us little windows of opportunity to realize, like, you're, you're with me. <laughs> and that, that, that father holding the son and the son being held by the father, I remember that moment being really integral for my understanding of prayer again. It's, it's a season of life that I'm in now, and I can't do the structured prayer maybe I was used to, but this is still prayer. Okay, branch that into spousal prayer, right? Rebecca prays differently. My spouse prays differently than I pray. I'm sure you guys would say the same. We all connect to our Lord in different ways. We've got our devotionals. We've got our um, rote prayers that certainly should be a part of our life, right? Our rosary, the stations, or family grace, spontaneous petitions that we do as a family. Very important, absolutely. But you can't, prayer is so unique, right? If it's putting our face before his face, we pray differently. Rebecca and I pray differently and at different times. Uh, there is absolutely moments when we come together. Maybe it's... Uh, for, for the rosary. Maybe it's a, it's a novena that we're practicing. Maybe we've got a, a devotional book for married couples and we move through it. We had a beautiful time doing Father Gately's uh, consecration, 33 days to morning glory. I, don't, I highly recommend that as a way to grow as spouses. Those pieces are out there. There's a lot of great ways for couples to pray in spousal prayer. I just want to put out there that you know it's going to be different. And prayer so wide. Find out what works, what seems to fit, and be open to that. Now, stepping aside from those like acts of prayer or postures of prayer, I just want to talk a little bit about actually what Nathan mentioned here with like domestic church. We all as men, as married men, as spouses, would share in a kind of domestic priesthood. It's the royal priesthood of Christ, right? But in a domestic church, your home, you really have a priestly role. So I try to make the home also an encounter with God and a kind of a prayerful place. So that when we go to church, it's not like oil and water, you know, <laughs> that these things are connected. So I think, and you know, you got to discern this and pray about this. Your home's not going to look like a monastery, but it could look like a nice retreat center, kind of. A holy water font in the beginning when you walk in your home. We have an icon of Our Lady Perpetual Help because we perpetually need her help. We've got a crucifix. Um, we have a statue of the Holy Family on our dinner table. Uh, keep the flowers fresh, boys. That's important too, right? For your spouse and for your domestic church. So these little things, rosaries hanging on the doors. Um, we've got uh, family prayer at night all together. Now with little ones, uh, the entire rosary might be unrealistic. I remember when we tried that. It was hilarious, right? The kids are running laps around the table. <laughs> rosaries are flying around, sword fights. Um, you got to discern that. Some of you are probably, this might be beyond you at this point, but... It's so important to think that like, kids need to learn the language of prayer and, and the, the structured prayer is important. Every night as a father, I have holy water in the home, which you can get from your local parish church. Probably I know that, right? Fill it up. We usually go by the gallon. And every night as a father, I go to my four children and I bless, I make the sign of the cross in their foreheads and I say, may the Lord bless and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord bless you and give you his peace. I love you, Seth, you're a gift to us. Claire, I love you, Claire, you're a gift to us. Sheila, I love you, Sheila, you're a gift to us. Kagan, you're a gift to us. Sometimes we use um, oil as well, and I might anoint their palms and just say, the Lord give you his joy and gladness. So brothers, sometimes I'm doing it just rote, you know, you're a gift to us. <laughs> I'm not feeling it, but I'm doing it. Okay, so that kids know that prayer is essential and prayer should be done every day. And I hope that they connect even with the sacramental signs of holy water or oil in the palm and the smell maybe of that, of that oil, that what's happening in our home is connected to what happens at church. That what's happening in the home is being a gift through this prayer so that when we go to church, we can also become a gift in prayer. They're definitely related. I hope that helps. And you know, we'd love to hear it during the Q&A time, like what's worked for you as far as family prayer and spousal prayer. Okay. First thing I have to say is uh, make a correction. Uh, 
God caused my wife and I to raise 13 children. The 54 grandchildren were subbing out to them. <laughs> so we can't take responsibility for that. Uh, but it's a great grace. Uh, my background, uh, for anybody from Western North Dakota, you maybe had a Splunskowski as your pastor. You know that we have a Benedictine background. So, uh, ora et labora, uh, to pray and work. Uh, so, I've been a Benedictine oblate, belonged to Assumption Abbey for uh, 53 years. And that's really kind of uh, had a, uh, an effect on the way we raised our children. Uh, not just because uh, it takes uh, nine girls to raise four boys. It's just a fact. <laughs> so um, so um, there's many times that we had to have something for those boys to do. Uh, we do, do live in Minnesota. So we heat our house with wood. So the wood pile always had work waiting, splitting, cutting, stacking. And that was what kept our, um, our boys busy in those times of stress when they had nothing to do or didn't know what to do with themselves. Uh, we, um, I was brought up praying the rosary uh, during the month of May and occasionally in the month of October. It was, it was a, a very um, important part of uh, our prayer life. And of course, with the Mass and family prayer, we prayed at every meal. Uh, that was probably the, the meal prayer was probably one of the most important uh, things that we used in our family to make sure that we all prayed together. Uh, night prayer. Uh, in the beginning of our family, we, we didn't... Uh, uh, do much more than that, uh, made a curcio, and uh, after that we started the rosary. And that was largely driven by our some of our oldest older children, um, and then it became really, really important, the daily rosary uh, for all of us. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, one of the main things that uh, uh, I believe is the the post that our family was built around. And it still is. The, the work that we did, we tried to instill in our children that the prayer that you say in, in the beginning of the day is part of the work that you do. And so that your work, whatever you're doing, uh, must be done the very best you can do it uh, in order to make it a good prayer. And that's easy to teach if you're doing it yourself. Uh, my dad always said that uh, your children will uh, do 10% of what you tell them and 90% of what you do. And that's very true. So uh, it's something always, I think, for a, especially a young father to keep in the back of his mind. Um, also, uh, another thing that I remember him saying is, uh, your children will become what you expect them to become. So if you uh, go around when you're angry and tell your kids they're going to end up in jail someday, they're going to do their best to make your wishes come true. So we, uh, uh, we expected, we told our children, that we really, truly expect you to become saints. Um, canonization is optional. So we did give them an out. I mean, they did have a... Uh, so, and then we tried to live that way and, uh, and talk that way and act that way. And uh, it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of been a, a good thing. Uh, I know when we first started praying the rosary, we prayed like my mom and dad prayed, uh, in a hurry. Because I can, I can remember hating when my dad said, okay, let's say the rosary now. And I said, oh my gosh, not again. 
And uh, so then we get down there and we would pray that Hail Mary and Holy Mary so fast that uh, actually uh, I had one of, one of my, uh, I had a business where I could always have one of my children with me uh, pretty much all day. Uh, so I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, contact with all of my children. And uh, so uh, uh, once, once one of my boys, who was quite young, he was asking me, well, Dad, you know, you tell us that we shouldn't say any bad words. But every time we say the morning offering, why do we say, why do we pray for all those asshole shits? We were saying associates. <laughs> so um, it, we we slowed down. <laughs> uh, that was a good lesson for us as parents. Uh, there were numerous other uh, situations where we learned lessons as parents. Uh, but um, the importance of turning everything that you do during the day into a prayer, I think, is, uh, is very, very important. Um, I guess uh, uh, I, learned, um, I learned how to be a father uh, by studying the Bible from cover to cover. Uh, numerous times, and uh, it picked up a few good hints. Uh, I learned uh, how to be a dad, uh, basically from my dad. And I think all of us do that same thing. And I think it's very important for every dad to realize that if he has a son, uh, that's, that's where he's going to learn to be a dad, regardless of what you do. Uh, they're watching. They're everywhere. So I guess my point is uh, to make, make sure that uh, everything that you do, you're aware uh, that you're teaching somebody something, even when you don't think there's anybody watching. So I guess that's all, basically all I have to say. I know uh, as, false, as far as spousal prayer, um, just being next to your spouse uh, is a prayer. And... Uh, even if you just pick something up off of the floor, like St. Teresa of, uh, of uh, Lisieux said, uh, if I pick a pin up for uh, another sister who can't pick it up for herself, that is one of the most powerful prayers I may have said that day. So uh, the, the, very, the tiniest little action, the tiniest little word, um, can be the biggest prayer that we have maybe said. Even if we sat down and, and prayed the rosary very devoutly, maybe that one little action is actually a more powerful prayer.